Right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the Queen Elizabeth Hall for this special event. Who thought we'd ever be having events like this again, but we're here, aren't we? Hey, and you've always all been wandering around, shaking hands, saying hello. Hopefully things can move back to normal if we can keep going on this track. So I hope you've enjoyed your food, you're all settled and ready to uh, have a listen to the panel, but also get involved in the discussion because we really want you to be part of this tonight. So I'm Kevin, I'm your host, and we really do have a fantastic panel for you. Uh, a big range of experience in smoking cessation and lots of different experience of different places and, and different uh, attempts and, and, and achievements in terms of trying to get people to stop smoking. So we're here to discuss how we go about making smoking history in Oldham. We've got people here in the audience at the tables from right across the health sector, from primary care, from uh, secondary care, from public health, also members of the voluntary sector. We've also got trading standards who are out and about uh, trying to track down all the illegal cigarettes and tobacco that really does people even more harm than the stuff that they can buy ordinarily and legally. Uh, and you are here, you've been invited and we hope you've come along because you're people who potentially have the opportunity to make that contact with people who do smoke and try and make the case to persuade them to take the first steps on the way to quitting. Now it's not going to be easy here in Oldham to get people uh, to quit. It, it never is, is it? It's a, a real strong addiction that gets a grip of people. And Oldham, it's a bigger challenge than most places because we're, we're behind other places. I'm sure many of you will be aware that the government has set a target of 5% smoking prevalence nationally by 2030. Currently in this borough, we're at nearly 18%. And in some parts of the borough, that's as high as 40%. So a big challenge ahead. And that means to meet the target, nearly every year in, in Oldham, 4,000 people would have to stop smoking if we were to get down to that 5% prevalence by 2030. So how can it be achieved? Well, that's what we're going to discuss tonight. It's hoped the new Oldham Tobacco Alliance can help. You're going to find out a bit more about that uh, shortly. There are some reasons for optimism here in Oldham. Some other facts and figures that might be of interest are that over the past five years, the reduction in women smoking while pregnant in Oldham uh, has gone down. It, it was 16% back in 2013. It's now down to around 13.5% in 2019. So um, positive uh, shoots for optimism there. Uh, and we can discuss all the kind of things that we can try and uh, take on here in Oldham to get things moving in the right direction. Now, we were going to have an introduction tonight from Dr. Zahid Shohan. Unfortunately, he's poorly, so that job uh, fell to me. We are honoured, though, to have uh, the Mayor of Oldham, Councillor Jenny Harrison, as a guest, and she's going to close the event for us later on. So thank you for coming along tonight, Councillor Harrison. Right, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, I'll just tell you what's lined up. You may have uh, seen in the booklet that uh, there's an exciting quiz on the way. We've never done one of these before, but that's just a, a bit of fun to get a sense of, you know, what you, you think of the facts and figures and your understanding of the prevalence of smoking and some of the challenges being faced here in Oldham. And then we've got the panel discussion. Uh, but first of all, we're going to get the panel uh, to introduce themselves. We've got a couple of people coming in online from... Um, other places, uh, not even in this country at the moment. One of them's out skiing. I won't tell you which one. Uh, and uh, we're hoping this is all going to work because we've, we've all learned how to use Zoom in the lockdown, haven't we? But first, we'll go along the panel uh, out here in front of us on the table. So uh, if we start, uh, start in the middle there, we've got Rebecca Fletcher. We're going to hear from Rebecca uh, in a few minutes' time about, about the, uh, the, the Oldham Smoking Alliance. But Rebecca is a consultant in public health working at Oldham Council. Just tell us uh, briefly about yourself, Rebecca. I feel this is a test that the microphone works. Can everybody hear me? Brilliant. Uh, hi, so hi everybody. Uh, I do know some of you. I'm Rebecca Fletcher. As uh, you said, I'm a consultant in public here, here in Oldham. I'm really passionate about the difference that reducing smoking can make to the health of the population and really addressing health inequalities. Um, I'm going to introduce a bit of stuff about the Alliance in a bit, but my background is very much that broader public health difference that reducing smoking is going to make to our entire population. Thank you. And we'll just move further along the panel. We've got Louise Ross. Until March 2018, a couple of years ago, she managed the Leicester City Stop Smoking Service, the first e-cigarette friendly service in the world. There's a lot more you can tell us as well, isn't there? 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of vaping uh, as a way of stopping smoking. I'm very pleased to see that the new NICE guidance is, is, has become much more positive about that. Um, uh, in addition to the things uh, mentioned here, that I, that I work for the National Centre for Smoking Cessation and Training, I'm also uh, working on the Smoke Free app, so digital support for, for stopping smoking. And the, the last line on my little bio is, is not right. It says the new tobacco alliance, which makes it sound as though I'm with the tobacco industry, which I'm absolutely not. Um, I'm, I'm chair of the new nicotine alliance, which is about tobacco harm reduction and alternatives to, to tobacco. Thank you. And further on at the end, we've got Tom Chu. Tom is the LGBT Making Smoky History, Smoking History Programme Coordinator for the LBT G Foundation and the Making Smoking History team in Manchester at Greater Manchester's Health and Social Care Partnership. A bit more about you, Tom? Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm Tom Chu. Um, I'm the Making Smoking History Programme Coordinator for LGBT Foundation. Um, I work in some of the wider population health as well with the uh, Making Smoking History team at the Great Manchester Health and Social Care Partnership. So I'm spread across two teams. Um, some of the wider population health work that I lead on is um, to do with smoke-free housing, so looking at social housing and, um, and the inequalities in smoking and smoking rates there, um, as well as working with the VCSE sector, so uh, non-profit uh, with regards to smoke-free events and smoke-free spaces. We Really trying to champion um, seeing those spaces become more smoke free and looking at the inequalities and barriers to accessing health services across the LGBT communities, uh, intersectionalities as well. So really just trying to champion stop smoking services to un understand inclusion. Um, so thank you for having me today. I'm really looking forward to it. Cheers. Thank you, Tom. Further along, we've got Elizabeth Woodworth, um, Head of Smoking Cessation Services for ABL Health, which provide a lot of the services in Oldham and other places as well. Sorry, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm Liz Woodruff. I'm the professional lead for ABL Stop Smoking Services. Um, my background is both delivering um, smoking cessation in secondary care, primary care, wherever anybody's got a smoker, to be honest. Um, so I've actually been doing this job now for a very long time. I'll say it like that, but it's well over 20 years. Um, but I am really passionate and to be honest it's nice to be back in Oldham because I used to manage this service a number of years ago and some of my old staff are still here so it's nice to be back. Thank you Liz. We've, all, we've also got Karen Clough from the Saving, Baby, a Saving Babies Life Specialist, midwife at Northern Care Alliance. Do you want to tell us a bit more about yourself? Yeah, so I've been a community midwife for over 20 years now and uh, took on a specialist role in the last three years. And I'm here today with our smoking, uh, smoke free pregnancy team. And we're really passionate to help women to stop smoking in pregnancy. Um, we get referrals from, from our midwives um, and we, you know, we have an excellent team that where we support women throughout the whole journey through pregnancy and postnatal period. Uh, but also a, a large part of our roles is to educate the midwives to keep smoking in pregnancy really high up on the agenda. Thank you. Right, we'll now on the big screen hopefully see our two extra guests coming in via the internet. Yep. Do you want to introduce yourselves and uh, just tell us a bit about your experience? If we go to you first, Professor Peter Hayek. Uh, hello, uh, good evening. My name is Peter Hayek. I'm a professor of clinical psychology uh, can you hear me over there? Can somebody confirm? So I'm not sure if you if you hear me, but I'll carry on anyway. Uh, I do research in addictions and uh, weight management. My work focuses primarily on smoking cessation. I've been operating many, many years ago, the Maudsley Smokers Clinic, which became a blueprint for the uh, National Social Services. And we still collaborate closely. Our research is usually linked to some practical uh, smoking cessation activities in, in, in the London area. And I'll be very happy to discuss the issues of our research. Okay, thank you, Peter. And now, if you just introduce yourself, Dr. Alex Borbach. 
Hi, it's uh, Alex Bovac. I'm, I'm a GP um, and I've been working in smoking cessation for over 20 years now. Um, it, it is my real passion um, and it's the thing I've pretty much devoted myself to as, as a special interest, simply because it is the thing where, where you can get more bang for your buck from the point of view of primary care, and yet it's not done. And I'm really pleased that Liz has asked me back to talk um, again um, in the context of trying to get um, an area which really could do with more smoking cessation, um, some ideas about how to carry that through practically um, from my point of view in the context of primary care. So thank you very much again for having me and um, I'm looking forward to talking. Right, so that's our panel for the rest of, of this evening. We're going to hear a bit more, first of all, about the Oldham Tobacco Alliance. And Rebecca Fletcher from uh, Public Health in Oldham Council is going to give us the lowdown. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, I wanted to thank you all so much for attending today and showing that your commitment to supporting tobacco control in Oldham. To start with, I wanted to quickly highlight some of the amazing process we have already made today. Been slightly spoiled on my data by Kevin, um, but uh, that smoking prevalence, even though we are, we are higher than the national average, we actually have already come down. So um, in 2012, we had one in four adults were smoking. We have brought that down to just under one in five, so that 18%. It's not what we want, but we have seen that difference. We have also have seen those reductions in the proportion of women smoking in pregnancy, and it's a really key priority due to the impact of smoking on healthy pregnancies and on health of babies. So the latest, very latest figures that we've had show that um, in one quarter it came down to only 10% of women smoking in pregnancy, which is an amazing achievement and an absolute uh, testament to my panel members' uh, team's hard work. And in addition, we have made all of the council-owned properties, vehicles, parks, and open spaces smoke-free. And that's to protect others from the harms of secondhand smoke. It helps to discourage young people from starting to smoke. And also that enables us to help that work, offering people to start thinking about stopping smoking. However, clearly we do have still lots more to do if we're gonna make smoking history in Oldham and achieve that ambition of being smoke-free by 2030. We know that smoking is the single biggest preventable cause of health inequalities. Smoking is far more common among routine and manual workers, as well as people with mental health condition, prisoners, looked after children, and the LGBTQ plus community. The more disadvantaged someone is, the more likely they are to smoke, and the more likely they are therefore to suffer from smoking-related disease and premature death. So if we can significantly reduce our smoking prevalence at a far faster rate than at present, then we will improve those health outcomes for people in Oldham, we'll support poverty reduction, we'll give babies and children a better start in life, we'll reduce health and social care costs, and as well as cutting crime by dealing with the illegal um, tobacco trade. And so that's why we're looking to form the Oldham Tobacco Alliance. And that's a collective partnership made up of representations like yourselves, that's my selling point. There's a pledge in your packs for you to sign up to join the Alliance and to pledge uh, what you're going to do to stop smoking in um, Oldham. Um, and that partnership is going to look at how we can take a strategic approach to three things. One, how do we make smoking less accept accessible, acceptable and desirable? Two, how do we empower successful quitting for those people who do smoke in Oldham? And three, how do we make sure that young people don't start to smoke in the first place? So by coming together to achieve these aims, we can improve the health and well-being of Oldham's population and reduce health inequalities experienced by some of our communities due to smoking and tobacco-related harm. And so today marks the start of that next step on our journey to making smoking history in Oldham. And we really welcome your inputs and suggestions as part of the panel discussions, I'm really hoping it's not going to be us giving you the answers and actually a lot of it will be you telling us as experts in Oldham what we need to be doing. Um, and the contributions from today's event, uh, they're going to feed into our development of the tobacco strategy and also the work of the Alliance. And as Team Oldham, we will continue to work together to tackle tobacco-related harm, and together we will make smoking history in Oldham. And that's my absolute plea for your help. Um, but hopefully that gives a bit of an overview about why we're here. Thank you, Rebecca. 
So that's the Oldham Tobacco Alliance. We're now just going to watch a short video to find out a little bit about the local stop smoking partnership here in Oldham. We were soon to learn that COVID was here to stay and that we needed to adapt our service pre-COVID. When patients are admitted to the hospital, they are offered nicotine replacement therapy to help with their cravings and then they're referred to us. Here at AVL Health, we are a dedicated stop smoking service. We're a great team, um, we're all highly trained and we are all passionate about the work we do. We get to um, be a very small part in helping and supporting people to totally transform their lives for the better. Currently when somebody comes to us, um, we have an initial session where we take lots of information off them um, and we discuss their past quits. What did you use? How did it work? How successful was it? What did you learn? Um, and we, we talk to them about all the current therapies that we have available. We go along to the patient's bedside and we make a more in-depth assessment. However, to reduce the risk of infection, we're not allowed to see patients on the wards in the high-risk phase. So we obtained bedside numbers, mobile numbers, we provided information packs so the nurse could give this to the patient, and we even contact the patients once they go home, just for a last attempt to make that contact to see if they want to quit smoking with support. We have a robust referral system so that when the patient leaves the hospital, they are quickly picked up by one of the referral teams, such as Your Health Oldham or Living Well in Rochdale. COVID's been a difficult time for us all, and as a service, clearly we knew had to pull out of clinics as soon as we went into lockdown, but um, it was really important that our service didn't stop and there was no way it was going to stop. Um, so we went totally to telephone support and we continued and I'll be honest we didn't really know whether it'd work or how successful it'd be um, but I think each of us you know every one of the team would agree that it's worked and it's worked better than we thought it was going to work in fact um, I would say going forward telephone support needs to be there it needs to be an option um, for people Our service relies heavily on effective communication and our team of four all have excellent communication skills which allows us to very quickly develop a trusting relationship. Trust is needed for the patient to be able to really tell us about their story, about their journey of being a smoker which allows us to help them. Client feedback is really important to us. A, if there's something that can be improved, then it's really important we know about that. Otherwise, how are we going to ever improve? Only a couple of weeks ago, I remember doing um, a 12 week follow up and we, we follow people um, up to 12 weeks weekly sessions. And I was doing the 12 week follow up with a lady and I actually said to her, what's different this time? Um, what worked for you? And she said, well, that's really easy, Lorraine, to be honest. She said, I'll tell you exactly what worked for me. She said, you know, this quit hasn't been easy for me. I've had my ups and I've had my downs and I've had a lot of downs. She said, but, um, she said, but when I spoke to you each week, we unpicked it, you didn't rush me. Um, and the one thing that was different for me is that you never ever judged me and you actually never gave up on me. Well, I think the biggest opportunity is we have now got back a totally dedicated stop smoking service. This is all we do. This is our job and we're really good at it. We get the best training ever and um, we know how to do it, which brings me on to what's the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is, unfortunately, some people out there still don't know that we exist.
Right, so you've watched the video. Uh, we're now going to move on and talk about some of the things that we think could, uh, could try, and, uh, try and help people in Oldham get on with quitting as quickly as possible. Just to set the scene though, we're going to have a bit of interactive fun. We've never done this before, so we'll have a go and fingers crossed it's all going to work as we are hoping. So, on your tables, you should have these look like a little red phone, essentially. You just need to press the menu button and just leave it a second and it should come up. So it's a dead easy quiz this. Well, it's easy to do. I don't even get the right answers. And it's just to get a sense of some of the facts and figures around smoking in Oldham and the habits of people uh, and the challenges that we might face here. So guys, you're gonna get the first uh, page of the, uh, the quiz up there. So this one is just a little warm, warm, a little one to warm you up. So what you have to do, you have to look up at the screen. Uh, you've got uh, a couple of options um, as we go through the quiz. T is for true, yes is for false. For these ABC ones, it's one, two, or three, it's A, B, or C. So you just need to press, press the, uh, the letter that you think is the correct answer, and it'll tell you. I can see it on this, this little bottom right-hand side. Nearly, nearly half of you have done it now. Is it working for everybody? There's a few still haven't done it yet, it says. It's a tricky one, isn't it, this? doesn't say what they were smoking. That would be a clue, wouldn't it, I think? If it said cigar. Although, Harold Wilson as well. It's hard work, this, isn't it? Not Tony Blair, though. He was a bit... Just 70%. Right, so there we go. So, responses. 40 of you thought it was Winston Churchill. Two Tony Blair. Don't know who they were. One might have been me. It was Winston Churchill, so now you get it, right? So essentially, first of all, it'll come up and it'll tell you what different people voted which way, and then one of the, uh, one of the bars will turn green, and that's when you get the answer. So I just nicked Karen's there. Right, right, we're on to the next question. What's the estimated smoking cost to Oldham each year without the additional cost of social care, which obviously adds to it? A, 30.4 million, B, 25.5 million or C, 50.4 million. All huge chunks of money, aren't they? What's the estimated smoking cost to Oldham each year? So give us your answer, A, B or C. Right, so a big chunk of your thoughts, C. And that is the right answer, 50.4 million, which is incredible, isn't it? When you talk about uh, amounts of money uh, and the impact that just, just one habit appears to be having on the people of Oldham. Right, on to the next question. May 2021, Professor Chris Whitty stated a type of cancer is almost entirely caused for profit. Is it breast cancer, lung cancer or bowel cancer? A, B or C? I think we might be able to guess this one. But we never know, do we? B. Virtually everyone went for B there. What's the right answer? And B it was. We could do with some, uh, some theme tune music under this, really, couldn't we, just to keep the beat going? Right, on to the next question. How many beds are taken up by patients with smoking-related problems? One in 20, one in 10... One in 25 or one in four. So you've got an extra option here. So it cranks the pressure up if you're just guessing. So I'll make your decision. So most people, 39 of you thought one in four. Let's see what the right answer is. Yes, it's one in four beds taken up by patients with smoking related problems, which is huge, isn't it? A quarter of people in hospitals. Next question, what is the prevalence of smoking in Oldham? I give you some figures, but my figures are out of date, as, as we might know. A, 14%, B, 25%, C, 17.9%, or D, 45%. So most people were listening to the introduction. That's C, 34 of you, 17.9%. What's the right answer then? And that was the correct answer, yes. 
Right, on to the next one. Is the smoking prevalence higher in Oldham than the national average? Yes or no? So you'll have to work it out which one you go for on the controls. Yes. It went 54 up to 58, up to six. It's like about six of you waiting to see everybody else's answer. So that's the right answer. On to the next one. According to Public Health England in 2020, which was the most popular aid used by people to quit? A, nicotine replacement therapy, NRT. B, varenicilline, Champix. Or C, vaping products. Obviously, vaping products come into the fore a lot more in these last few years, haven't they? So most of you went for vaping products. What was the right answer? And you were right on that, yep. Vaping products. Now the most popular way to try and quit. Just a couple more. How many people die early every day in Oldham because of smoking? Is it A, 1, B, 2, C, 3, or D, as many as 10? What's your answer? Okay, what have we got? Oh, we might be stalling here. It was going so well, wasn't it? Is everybody touching wood? Touch some wood. Signal's gone, isn't it? Well, we'll have one more, one more crack at it and then we can move on, can't we? So you wrote these, didn't you, Elizabeth? So what's the answer on this one? Three. Three. Three people die early every day in Oldham because of smoking, which is incredible, isn't it? Oh, we're cracking on. One more. An all-party parliamentary group in smoking and health has recommended raising the age of sale for tobacco products to what age? 16, 18, 21 or 25? Off you go. On to the answer. The answer is actually C. All right then, we seem to be stalling a little bit on that, but you've got the gist of it, so we'll, we'll move on to the panel now. So we'll finish with the quiz there, if that's okay with everybody. Who knew tonight was gonna to be so exhilarating, eh? Right, okay, so on to the panel. So they've introduced themselves, um, Obviously, they've got all different perspectives, different points of view, different expertise in various areas. Uh, we want to hear what they think about the big challenges and how we overcome them, but also we want to get, get your views and hear your questions as well. You've all got your own uh, points to make, I'm hoping. So, if you do want to ask a question once we get going, if you just put your hand up, I'll give you the nod, and then on every table you've got a microphone, and you just need to press, press the button, it should come on red, and then you can ask your question. All right then, but first of all, we'll just bounce along a couple of the panel and just to set the scene a little bit. And, and if, we, if we kind of start from the, this end with you, Karen, what would, if I asked you, what would the one thing that you could change to really try and speed things up in terms of more people giving up smoking? What is the one thing that you would say would make a difference? So I think women in pregnancy find it hard to stop smoking and some of the barriers we have in our service is access to NRT. So if we can give women NRT very quickly, then it doesn't put any barriers in place for them to, to start that quit straight away. So that's my number one um, real barrier that we have within our service. Okay, thank you for that. And Elizabeth, what, what's your one thing that you think, if we could just do this, that would give us a real kick on? For me to just be making smoking everybody's business so that we get the referrals into the service that we should get 
and um, an easy access actually to pharmacotherapy. And when you say everybody's business, what do you mean by that? Um, a lot of people think smoking is easy to actually give up. It's always been seen as a lifestyle choice. And things have moved on now, it's changed. We've got a different type of clientele that we had 20 years ago, because a lot of people, more people did smoke. What we've got now are the real hardened, ingrained smokers who've got lots and lots of life issues as well um, that they have to deal with. Um, so a lot of people who used to pass people to services before think Joe Bloggs won't quit, but Joe Bloggs will quit and we need those referrals to come through to make smoking history. And you need people to have those conversations. That's right. All right, then we'll dive up to the big screen now and bring uh, uh, our, our, two, uh, our two guests in on the big screen. Can we hear from them now? Are they still there? Yep. Yeah. All right, we'll come to you first, uh, Alex, Dr. Alex Borbeck. What's the one thing that, that you would like to see that you think could make a big difference? Well, I wish it was just one thing, but there are so many things that need to be done. But I think one thing which uh, Lorraine, the stop smoking person who spoke very well in the video, uh, finished off with was people don't even know we're here. You know, and that counts for the stop smoking services as well as what we can do in primary care. And speaking to the GP, the thing that I would really, really like to happen, and what I've been trying to help happen over a long time now, is getting awareness of what we can do in primary care to get people to stop. I think there's a lot of uh, negativity among GPs and others about what we can do. But there are drugs which work, and there's the support from the Stop Smoking Services work. And getting that awareness out there is something we could really do. All right, then. And then, Peter, a lot of your research across a long career has been about understanding health behaviours, evaluating pharmacological treatments for dependent smokers. What have you learned that you think this could be a, a big game changer? <laughs> Somebody mentioned this hardening of the smoking population, that smokers who, middle-aged smokers who still smoke, uh, now when we have very low smoking prevalence across the country, are people who are seriously dependent on their cigarettes and for whom quitting smoking is not that easy. In the past, it was very different. You, you know, there were lots of recreational, occasional smokers, but they mostly quit. And so people out there, are very often uh, people who really can't do it without help. And all the points which other people made here were good points, uh, that they should be aware of the service, of the range of uh, treatments that can be provided, that they really can be helpful, and that it is possible to either stop smoking altogether, stop using nicotine, or switch to some uh, much less dangerous form of it which would be increasingly more important for the remaining smokers, the smoking prevalence uh, declines further. Okay, thank you. We'll come to you next, Tom. I mean, a lot of your focus is on ensuring that everybody has access, and everybody has equal chance to get the support that they need. So what, what from your experience, uh, do you think could help make a difference? I think it would, I would say, trying to break down that social uh, misconception that there is still around smoking, I think, well, it's stop smoking services. I think a lot of parts of the community and society across all spectrums think that when they access a stop smoking service, they're gonna be dictated to, they're gonna be told off effectively for smoking. And really, I think we need to break down that barrier um, and have a more of a holistic approach to it to understand the reasons why people might smoke. I think a vast majority of people who smoke do want to quit smoking, I just think, there's that, there's that kind of divide there that we need to kind of fix together and bring together that, you know, when you seek help, you're not going to be dictated to, you're not going to be shamed for smoking. There is a help out there, but maybe there needs to be more holistic approaches to approaching that to, from maybe community-based uh, approaches or societal-based approaches, you know, communities of faith, LGBT communities, delivering that support initial step. I think that's probably what would help people more instead of just necessarily the clinical approach, which is fantastic and it helps but I think we need to have more options for people because people not necess not everyone necessarily accesses it through a primary care aspect so that's what I would say 
And Louise, your experience, a lot of it was in, in Leicester, a place not dissimilar to Oldham in, in, in many ways in terms of um, the demographics and the different cultures there and, and, and the different communities. What would you say, from your experience, in a place like Oldham can get the message across to communities where sometimes you might be struggling? I think that having a really strong tobacco control alliance is absolutely key. It, it has to be everybody's business. And, and I think, um, you know, as, as, as Liz said earlier, um, you know, some, some agencies, some organisations may think that it's, it's done, it's sorted. And, and you know, you, you get in some services that some, you know, frontline staff are waiting for somebody else to mention smoking. It has to be something that's raised at every interface with, um, you know, with, with, with somebody who smokes. And, uh, you know, as you said, it has to be in a non-judgmental way so that people know that this is beneficial. It's not you know you're being punished for your smoking right we'll get your thoughts in a, in a moment Rebecca but just to let you know we, we're ready for questions now so if anyone does have a question after this please do get your hand up and we'll come to you uh, as soon as we can so yeah so Rebecca obviously you've alluded to some of the, the challenges particularly that that face all them from your point of view what what is the the one thing I, I know I'm picking on one but is there something that you think this could make a difference if only we could get going with that. I feel like I'd like everything that the panel have already said. I'd like all of those. Um, I think in addition, I think the thing that does help to make the difference is how we can build a broader structures in society that make it easier for people to not smoke. Because actually a lot of what we've talked about is how we support individuals to stop smoking, which is really important. But a lot of how we'll make that difference is how we make smoking less acceptable in society or less easy and, and actually really support people to not smoke by making it not something that they see everywhere around them, to make it really not the norm to have everybody smoking everywhere. That will help because we'll create a society where actually that will make it easier for people to stop smoking. But it also, most importantly, it will make it easier for people to not start smoking. And I think it's by doing that. So things like smoke-free legislation made a really big difference. But what can we do to take things like that further in Oldham? And it's those other supportive mechanisms that will mean that when people go and access our amazing services to give up smoking, they won't be make, there won't be other things that will make that harder for them because it's already really hard. So that, to me, would be the things that I'd like to see over and above this. And Karen, one of the areas where we have had some success and things that are moving forward is your area. What, what are the conversations that you're able to have or what's been done differently in the last few years that you think is starting to cut through in that area? Yeah, so we've had real changes in maternity in terms of smoking cessation. We've now got a team uh, together which consists of maternity support workers or specialist advisors and specialist midwives as well. So we've got dedicated, um, you know, a team within the maternity services that, that lead um, the way for smoking cessation. Um, we've also uh, really benefited from, from using CO monitors, so carbon monoxide monitors. We use these really regularly in pregnancy and we can identify smokers via the CO monitors. We can um, identify um, smoky homes or a person, you know, living with somebody who smokes as well. And we can act on that and we can use that CO reading to help us to, to plan a woman's care, but also to, to give her the right um, options, the right NRT uh, and support her. And, and, and having a CO that's 12 and then quitting smoking and then having a CO reading of three or two is a really inspirational for the woman. You know, she can see her CO levels coming down. It's a real big achievement. And we found that tool so useful. Yeah. And when, when you're, you're dealing and supporting with the women that, that you're supporting, is there an understanding from them that they know they need to do something about it? Or do you still have to try and convince some people that it's in their interest, but especially in the interest of the baby? Absolutely. So we have quite a strong conversation with the women about, you know, the effects of smoking in pregnancy. And the midwives are trained to deliver what's called a very brief advice. Uh, so they do the first conversation with the woman and then they refer to us. And the message that we're getting across to the midwives is that that referral needs to be really quick and really urgent. And the women need to understand that this is a 
concern. Um, so when they do actually come into our service, um, our specialist midwives and specialist maternity support workers then have those conversations. But it's, it's again, the same themes coming through. It's, it's our work is to try and get smoking on the agenda all the time. We, as specialist midwives, are battling with other specialist midwives because they have their own messages that they want to get through and it's constantly keeping smoking up there. Yeah. Right, well, we'd really like to hear from some people in the room if you've got experience of trying to have those conversations because I suppose a big push of this whole initiative is to try and get more people having those conversations so more people end up being referred to the support services that are there once people have made the decision to, um, to try and make a change, haven't they? And, and Elizabeth, ABL Health, you provide a lot of the smoking cessation support services for people and when people come to you what thought process have have they gone through to to get to the stage where they've, they've decided they want to stop and they're going to ask for help that's what it is. <laughs> sorry I'm, I'm blind really um, yeah really it's something that shocked them uh, a lot of the time they've had a health scare um, but unfortunately, as soon as they are mended in inverted commas, they do go back to smoking. Um, so it's getting them into that frame of mind that this is a long-term thing that they need to do. The unfortunate thing that I think you actually touched on is about the illicit and counterfeit tobacco that people are smoking. So we know it's very expensive and we know when we do get people to actually quit, we do take people out of poverty as well. Um, but unfortunately, why we've still got those cheaper cigarettes, cheaper tobacco, cannabis use, all of that will never really eradicate smoking. So it's got to come from that, that end as well, as well as just treating the smokers. Rebecca, and that is a question many people wonder, well, if, if people are, are struggling with, with various elements of their life and smoking is something that, that they do, it is incredibly expensive, isn't it? So they, they do potentially turn to some of these, these cheaper, more harmful, illicit, illicit uh, cigarettes. Uh, how has the pandemic changed things at all? I mean, there was talk earlier on that more people were taking smoking up again because they were stressed, but then also maybe others, it was a moment where they thought, I'm going to change things. I think, oh, I'm feeding back in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I'm not very <laughs> Is that okay? Sorry about that, everybody. Um, obviously, yeah, the pandemic has changed everybody's lives in ways I don't think any of us could have predicted. And I think it's obviously impacted on people smoking. One of the things that, um, things like the smoke-free places I talked about, where people were maybe going out to pubs or bars or restaurants where you can't smoke there, then they're sat with their friends talking, that would reduce their smoking. Whereas if you're sat at home, um, particularly during the difficult times of lockdown. People might have smoked more at that point, but we also recognise it was a time where people had time to themselves and they might have made a decision to potentially make changes in their lives. I think um, coming back to the illicit tobacco world, it's really important that we all work together to address that. Um, that collaboration and the alliance were bringing together police, trading standards, and, and everybody who works on, on illicit trade is going to be really key, um, as well as addressing underage sales, making sure that one of the most effective ways of reducing smoking is to increase the cost because it is, it, it's expensive. But actually, if we have treat, cheap tobacco flooding our streets, how do we stop people from smoking? It's really, really hard, as well as recognising the criminal elements there. So rec that, that work on reducing illicit tobacco and then also supporting people to see that giving up smoking will make a massive difference to people's financial worries, which we know lots of people in Oldham have. And I think that that's just really one of the key students of work that we need to pick up on this, that we will be making lives it easier for people to give up by really addressing that. And Tom, I'll just ask you a question about uh, kind of the access to, to the support, because part of your mission is to try and reach out to people who, who may ordinarily miss out on some of the, the ordinary avenues for where they would get that support. Where, where are you trying to instigate these conversations and trying to reach people who may still be smoking and would give up if only someone offered to help? So I think, we, as we've mentioned, you know, the pandemic has massively 
reduced our capacity to engage with communities. I think we've all found it very difficult to do our jobs normally. We've adapted, but certainly a large part of um, the work that we do across the Making Smoking History team and also my colleagues at LGBT Foundation, you know, out of context, we do provide a lot of health and wellbeing services as well. A lot of those had to become digital. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people have slipped through the gaps. Um, there's a report that we wrote just for the initial lockdown called Hidden Figures, and it talks about the disproportionate effect the lockdown had on LGBT people that a lot of them do live alone or isolated. So if you're not able to go out because of the pandemic and you have mobility issues, for example, you, you are going to struggle to access services. And we've had to, had a, we've had to have a massive rehaul of, and rethink of how we deliver the work that we do. And it has been mentioned here today by ABL, everyone. You know, I think go, moving forward, I think that's a really important factor we need to, we need to considering is that, you know, whilst face-to-face -face, um, support is important, we do also need to keep that digital element as well, because people aren't comfortable accessing primary care services, certainly from that, the aspect of LGBT communities. People are feared of being um, outed, uh, misgendered. It does happen a lot. It, I think statistically it's like nearly 80% of trans people have been misgendered when they're accessing a primary care service. So, the work that we do have at LGBT Foundation is just simple access to resources and signposting to say, you know, this is where you can get the support and services. This is the broaden people's knowledge. And that kind of goes hand in hand with Making Smoking History team. We've had a relaunch and a rebrand of the project of the brand. You know, it's simple, easy wins of how you can stop smoking, how you can um, keep going and not give up, you know, the, the cost element of smoking as well. I think people are shocked by that, how much smoking costs. If we drive home those, those facts about that, people start to think about it differently. And we have had a lot of people go, oh, wow, I didn't realize that. That's going to make me quit even more because, you know, I can potentially not fall behind on my rent by simply quitting smoking. So that's a really fa important factor that we do consider, to have people consider when they are trying to quit smoking. Right, I think we have our first question over there. If you'd like to press your button and ask your way. Uh, yeah, my question's for, um, for Louise around um, e-cigs and, and vaping. It's kind of twofold, really. I just wondered, have you noticed greater success with any kind of particular demographics by using e-cigs e to helping them quit? And also, during those quits, is it more difficult to manage the nicotine addiction because they don't have that sort of that titrated approach that they might have with NRT, for example? Thank you. Uh, so two questions there. Um, the demographics of, of people who, who you know, would typically switch. I, I don't think there is a, a typical picture. Um, in the services, we see people, um, you know, young adults um, using, using vaping to switch, but, you know, all ages up to, you know, very, you know, very much seniors, 60, 70, even 80-year-olds, particularly those who have got respiratory difficulties and, um, you know, know that their smoking is killing them and they're willing to try anything because, you know, we know that smokers will say, I've tried everything and then something new comes along and, and they think, yeah, this is, this is the something new that might actually do it for me. The, the key, though, seems to be whether their respiratory physician supports that, you know, and if, if they've got a clinical team that are against it or, or who are saying that, you know, this is, this is, you know, just as bad as smoking, they won't switch, they'll carry on smoking. So it's really important to get that, that accurate information out to healthcare professionals as well. Um, but, you know, in terms of demographics, male, female, old, young, um, uh, you know, different ethnicities, you know, there, there seems to be a desire to try something different that might actually work. As far as titrating down, um, in my experience clinically, people are very happy to, to start to reduce their nicotine level. So they, they might start at 18 milligram and go down to 12, 6, 3. Um, and sometimes go on to, to zero milligram and, and then maybe stop it altogether. But essentially, if they want to continue for years, it's better than smoking. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Right, we'll just come down here on the... Hi, I think this um, is really for Rebecca, really. Can you hear me? If you get a bit closer, that might be better. Oh gosh, here we go. It's like Slide it over to you, yeah. It's like karaoke, this, isn't it? <laughs> uh, what would you like? Yeah. Um, so, we've noticed, we're from the smoke-free pregnancy team over at Oldham, 
So we've noticed some uh, raised carbon monoxide levels. And when we've delved deeper, um, we've realised that, pe that women are coming from smoky homes, so there's somebody else in the, in the homes that smoke, or they kind of like said, no, I don't live in a, where somebody smokes, but they use shisha. So um, we're just wondering why there's so many new shisha bars that have come up in Oldham and people Licenses. seem to be all, they've got these licenses and people seem to be congregating in these shisha bars and they don't realise that they, it's still carbon monoxide that they're taking on and then taking them back home um, to the wives and girlfriends that are pregnant and then, we, you know, we're coming across this problem then. Do you want to pick up on that one, Rebecca? Because I guess that is something which would be a challenge in Oldham, which wouldn't necessarily be in areas with different communities, would it? I think there's quite a lot in there that's really important we need to pick up. Some of that is the broader smoke-free homes conversation for women that are pregnant and how we support that. And I know that ABL support partners of, of pregnant women and about the fact that it's not just about supporting mums, mums-to-be to give up smoking, but ensuring that that pregnancy occurs in a smoke-free home, just as that baby's born into a smoke-free home and, and grows up in that smoke-free home. I think the shisha bar conversation is something we need to pick up in, in, the, alli in the alliance because we need to bring together the parts of the council that look at licensing, that look at environmental health, and look at their health and safety, but also how we communicate with our communities about health risks in a way that's meaningful for them because I think we've, we communicate a lot, but actually it's, it's how that's a meaningful com communication that's not just about we tell you something's bad. <laughs> it's about how actually what makes sense to you, what's meaningful, and, and particularly, have you got somebody that's pregnant in your home? Have you got a child in your home? Actually, this is the health risks for them. So I really think this is part of that conversation with our communities about how do we talk to communities about those risks and then how do we make the rules in place that will actually make that as easy to be safe as possible so I think it's a brilliant point to have raised and something that we can put on the agenda to, to really pull at the, at the forefront so thank you If we could just bring in our, our guys down the line uh, we'll see what they're thinking on this particular area and, um, and Alex um, Obviously, a big part of your job is communicating the messages, isn't it? I mean, things are changing, aren't they, in terms of public information? You've got social media now. Probably the leaflets aren't the way that, that people do it these days. What have you learned about how we can try and get messages across to, to, to audiences who might not necessarily be particularly interested or listening out for it? How do you cut through? Really, really hard. <laughs> I mean... I, I've learned more about social media from my kids than anyone. And what I'm learning about is this concept of echo chambers where people just listen to what they want to believe. And, you know, authority figures or evidence-based guidance trying to counter that is really difficult. Um, and I think all that we can do in the positions that we're in is simply give informed advice that's as, as a GP or as a, uh, a nurse, a hospital doctor, a dentist, a physio, or anyone who's involved with patient contact can give consistent good advice on how to stop smoking. And I think that's probably the most important thing, that we have training across the board for health professionals who can give consistent, correct advice on how to stop smoking, which includes um the use of vaping as well as all the orthodox treatments and the support which we know works that just is not happening at the moment uh, it shouldn't be a difficult thing to organize uh, but we have a lot of resistance from the education bodies and i have to say we have quite a lot of resistance from established professionals who should know better and just a little bit of housekeeping from the guys on the front desk apparently the um the traffic wardens are out in force, so if you're not 100% that you've, uh, you've, you've sorted out your car parking, um, maybe you should sneak off and double check it and come back. There's no free parking in Oldham at night, so you've got to, you really have got to pay for the time that you're here. Right, we'll just pick up with, um, 
with, with you, Peter, on that, I mean, we mentioned vaping earlier. Earlier on in the quiz, we were talking about how vaping is now kind of one of the most popular ways to try and address uh, uh, smoking cessation, try and get people to quit. But isn't there also a question about young people being um, attracted to smoking in that way because it's become different and cool? Can you give us your insights on, on vaping and, and the, the role it's currently playing in attempts to get people to stop smoking? So there are these two issues, uh, whether it's helping smokers quit and whether it attracts children to smoking. Now, it does help uh, smokers quit. There is now strong evidence from observational studies, epidemiology, uh, and randomized control trials, and there is no question that people are affected as sort of smoking cessation. We can discuss later this issue of these people still using nicotine, whether it's a matter of concern or not. To my mind, it's not much of a concern because it's got minimal health risks. Uh, but you know, this is something which, which is open for discussion. Now, regarding the other issue, for many people, uh, e-cigarettes are dangerous because they could potentially attract non-smokers who would never pick up smoking uh, they would try cigarettes and then the, the worry is they would do something strong and they end up smoking. Uh, that's a legitimate concern, but fortunately, the data which we now have and which are, again, pretty persuasive are reassuring. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you're getting the, uh, the echo. I'm getting it quite strong. You can hear what I'm actually saying. No, you're okay yeah. there, Peter. You're okay. Well, thank All you. Right. Thank you for that. No. Uh, and, and on that, the, the whole different developments in in ways to support people and ways to, to treat the addiction. What's your take on on whether we're in a, a better place than we, we were, and whether it, I'm not saying it's easier to give up, but there's there's more different ways that you can find support, isn't there, Elizabeth? Yes, there are. Over time, we, we've actually changed. Originally, when we started Stop Smoking Services many, many years ago, we had people working in groups, and that was the only thing we ever did. As times moved on, then we started to see people on a face-to-face -face basis, on a one-to-one. -one. Now things have moved on, so we can use digital support. People can support themselves, basically, through digital um, through the pandemic, we've solely, as Lorraine said on, on the, the film, um, we just went to work remotely. And that will actually be part of the way we work now because it's worked so well that we will be delivering really a blended approach. So it won't be just one method that we can help people to stop smoking. It will be one person having multiple interventions so they could use a digital support with telephone support face to face so it will actually be tailored to them completely yeah. right and that's making a difference um, have we got any questions any more points that you want to just give us your point of view the lady over there on that back table hi there i think oops i think some of this has been answered but oldham is a very diverse town how will you tackle the different tobacco uses in these diverse communities so such as shisha such as Snuff, Naswar, Barn, the tobacco in the mouth, how will these be dealt with, supported, the communities? And this is, this is news to me. I mean, I knew there were shisha bars, but I hadn't realised that there was such a, such a range. And, and then I guess the next question is, well, what, you know, how much more harmful is it and how much more addictive? So what do we know about the, the different kind of tobaccos being smoked in places like Oldham? I'll start a tiny bit of that answer, but I will probably have to pass on to our more expert panel members. I think my first answer to that is this is one of the reasons why we need an alliance rather than just one of us, because actually it's the information from our communities about how tobacco is being used, um, how it's fitting into part of people's lives and how it's actually being, you know, it's part of a community, part of a way of being. And it's only by knowing that that we'll ever be able to make a difference. So that's why you can't just to be fair, sit on a table and give an answer because actually it's about that two-way conversation with our communities about how does different tobacco use really make sense for you in your community and how can we help 
and what can how can that work together so I feel like that's that's where this is as I said before it's a start of a conversation because you're actually many people on in the floor have the answers to some of that and we have maybe some of the answers and it's about that coming together um, but I, I would have to pass on to other members of the panel around where they feel and I think particularly some of our existing services about how some of that sports already happening but I think we're still at the beginning of that conversation um, and it's a really good really good question is there anyone who wants to pick up on that um, well for me I would just like to say that some of these communities that we do actually work with don't understand it's their culture to, to you actually use some of this tobacco use and um, and we need to get those messages of harm out to those communities um, and work from there but it, it is and this is a bit you've said it this is why we need to come together um, to understand what is actually going on out there but we can treat that addiction with what we've already got um, and it's just getting those messages over first but it's about those communities understanding that harm and part of that message is trying to stop people doing it in the first place isn't it you've almost got the two challenges which we're dealing with here which is is trying to get, help people to stop smoking but trying to stop them to, to start and do the harmful stuff in the first place did you want to chip in there karen yeah, I've got a really good example of this as well, and I think the key is getting that message across that, of the harm that shisha in particular can cause. Um, I uh, run a pre prevention of preterm birth clinic, and uh, as part of that clinic, um, we do a CO screen, and we screened a lady who blew an 18, which is particularly high. I asked her if she smoked, and she said, no, I stopped. Um, I stopped with my last pregnancy, which was great. So I was questioning her where this CO could have come from. We were asking her about her, her, her boiler, whether that was faulty. We were asking, uh, has she you know, been around anybody that smoked? But we wouldn't expect you know, a CO to be so high. And when I asked her about shisha, she said, oh, yeah, I, I do smoke shisha. My expectation of shisha was that it was it was used in a household similar to how would I, I would have a glass of wine. So maybe in an evening, as a, in a social occasion. But actually in this house, it was lit in the morning. It was used all day. And this lady actually puffed on the shisha um, maybe 15, 20 times a day whenever she was doing a little bit of hoovering. She'd go past the shisha, she'd have a, a puff on it. And so actually her CO levels were extremely high for the majority of the day, which was actually causing you know, a loss of harm to her baby. And when I actually asked asked her um, whether you know she was shocked that shisha would cause the CO she didn't she didn't perceive it to be smoking which was a real eye-opener for me she thought she was a non-smoker she was asked whether she smoked in pregnancy and she said no and it was through the CO that we actually found out and a little bit of digging that we that we found the the, the, the problem so she was saying, no, I don't smoke cigarettes, so Absolutely. I'm a non-smoker. Yeah. She's a non-smoker. And she actually said, which was really, really uh, interesting for me, was nobody asked me if I smoked shisha. Yeah. And so after that incident, we've changed our guidelines. We ask women if they smoke shisha, if they smoke cannabis, and if they smoke cigarettes. And it does actually give off 25 times. It's yes, yeah. yeah, much more harmful than cigarettes. So asking the right questions at the right time is, is, is absolutely, crucial. absolutely yeah. crucial. We've got a question down here. If you just press your button, I'll come to you next. Just, just to update really that um, part of the Your Health Oldham team, we're developing um, a Shisha um, champion project. So that's people within the community who want to spread the messages around the dangers of Shisha and working with the whole team on that. It's been delivered in other areas that I've worked in and it's been really successful because there is that misunderstanding in the, in the communities that use shisha that it's, it's less harmful because the smoke passes through water or um, in some instances I've been told it's one of your five a day because it's fruit tobacco. There's been all sorts of misconceptions and the myths out there um, and when you actually fill people in and let them know the facts around the dangers associated to shisha, they're absolutely amazed. And really, a lot of families are saying that, you know, they, they were allowing children to do it because they really were that unsure or that certain that it was it had positive health benefits. It was some of the feedback we were getting. So we know and we're looking for if there is any people in the room today that want to be volunteers for that. Um, we really are looking at setting up that sort of really community-based um, action to make sure that people get the messages around the dangers of smoking shisha. So we are we are on with it, um, it as part of the Your Health Olden project. And that's a big challenge, isn't it? When it is. a big chunk of the community 
and people who live around there believe a certain thing, you're trying to have to persuade them that's it's, not the case. It, it's, it's making sure that people know the facts. Nobody would ever put their children um, in harm's way purposefully, knowingly. So it's making sure that if you're going to do it, make sure you know the facts, make sure you're informed and, and that for that exact reason, people are saying that they're non-smokers, but they're smoking shisha on a daily basis. So it's making sure that that's a, a well-known um, fact in the community as well, so that people are making informed choices. Right, I'll come to you in one sec, but we'll just take a quick question over there from um, our colleague from Trading Standards. Did you have something to contribute in this particular area? <coughs> yeah, it was just in regards to the pan and the gutka that you mentioned before. I, um, it was quite a few, few years ago now that we did um, a bit of a, of a survey where I went round to the local shops just to see, and because quite often they're in right. Sorry, if you just just talk directly into the mic <laughs> and it'll pick you up better. Yeah, it, so it's the gutka and the the, um, the pan, and they're in quite shiny packaging. And um, when I was going round, they were all in where the sweets confectionery was. They'd be they'd be stored there, um, and it's a, so it's a bit of the shopkeepers didn't realise they were doing anything wrong. Um, it's got nicotine in them if you've got to be in the gantry behind you. Um, so it was a bit of awareness amongst the community who were selling them as well. Um, that was obviously a, a few years ago now. Um, so I think there is an element of, the, from Trading Standards point of view, that we need to get back out there um, and make it more known again amongst the community of that, that kind of work that needs to be done. But I just think it's lack of knowledge as well. Um, on that bit. All right, thanks for your point on that. Uh, raring to go over this side, aren't we? Press your button and off you go. Hello, I'm Natasha from Old and Uh We'd like to ask that um, since there's 50.4 million spending, would it not be better to make incentivised referrals, like getting involved in directly into the communities, like the individuals, like ours, Greenhill, um, would it not be better to talk to the smokers directly and basically try and incentivise referrals into the service? That is a fair point, isn't it? I mean, just imagine what you could do. I bet you'd love that 50 million, wouldn't you, to, to spend on this? But it's an incredible amount of money, isn't it, to, 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 to spend on the costs of this? And where, where are we with the, the kind of budgets you have to make the interventions that you're doing with ABL Health and others? I mean, is... Is, is a lack of funding an issue? Or is, it, is it something you're calling for more of? Um, budgets are always an issue. Um, I think um, we obviously want to prioritise the prevention because, as the point there is, is clearly made, that uh, we're spending an awful lot of money on treating the ill effects of, of smoking. And what we want to do is, is stop those ill effects because by the time somebody's sick um, from smoking, we want them to not have been sick in the first place and we want to make that difference to start with but clearly we have a, a, a large proportion of our population who have been smoking for a long time and who will continue to to suffer the ill effects of of that smoking over the coming years and so sadly nobody's been able to to find that 50 million to take out of the system and then give it to us to prevent because people are still getting sick and are still having those ill effects of smoking we are investing in smoking prevention, but I think new and innovative ideas about how we could do that better and how we could do that differently, I think are in, really important for us to look at because um, we have been able to bring smoking prevalence down overall, but clearly there are parts of our communities that we haven't been able to make that difference for and actually maybe different ways would be, would be better. And I know ABL are already working in many different ways to try and do that and I think the smoking and pregnancy work shows how some, doing something different can make the difference the cure work in in hospitals where really direct work with people when they came into hospital has been incredibly innovative across across Greater Manchester and has made a big difference so clearly innovation can work and uh, I don't think we should stop now so I, I guess we'd love to have that full amount of money and I'd love to be able to spend it on prevention that would be great but Sadly, we're not in that position, but that doesn't mean we can't think about innovation. And I think that the work that we've already put in place has shown that, we're, that that's what we're trying to do. But we'd love to keep that conversation going about what, what other ideas are there. Um, I don't know, Liz, do you want to come in on the ABL approach? or? I think getting as many people 
to try and quit using all sorts of different innovative ways like the digital. We can, you know, the, we do still have different categories of people, well, we shouldn't categorise people, but there are sort of managerial people who find it easier to quit than the people who live in severe deprivation, and that's where our time needs to be. So we can actually bring that prevalence down in different areas using different methods. Um, but, you know, we keep saying it that we need everybody to play a part in, in that, and it is from that illicit and counterfeit tobacco issue at the bottom and the people referring into our services at the top. Tom, what's your experience with the LGBT community in terms of the conversations you're, you're trying to have? Is it, is it that you, you get access to people and then they need some persuading, or by the time they, they come to, for your support, are they, are they ready to quit? I think when people access services or have those conversations, they're already fully aware of the harms of smoking, that they want to quit. You know, I don't think there's many, I don't want to rash, uh, generalize, but I don't think there's many people that are smoking out there that, specific, especially tobacco, cigarettes, that think there are health benefits in this day and age. I think we're all fully aware of the issues. In the context of LGBT communities, the one main thing that keeps coming up and up again is that barrier to accessing a service, that they don't feel represented, they don't feel understood, um, and people don't really necessarily see people's sexual orientation or trans status or gender identity as interlinked with their health issues. They don't, a lot of primary care people don't really necessarily see that. And I think for LGBT people, that's where they are reluctant to, to access a health service. So I've spoken to people who would rather not go to a GP appointment, not even just necessarily with regards to smoking, but any health issue, because they don't want to go through the pain, the embarrassment, the awkwardness of having to explain themselves. Um, and I think, that is a big barrier for people, LGBT people smoking, is because they want to stop, but they don't know how to stop. They don't know how to get that access because it actually links in quite well with a piece of work I've read. I'm sure people have read it um, regards, uh, with, from the British Lung Foundation with regards to uh, VBA training, a uh, very brief advice that a lot of GPs don't actually necessarily go through that training. Um, there's actually a very small percentage of health professionals that have had that intervention work. And I think that's a really easy, quick win linked with some form of uh, inclusion training, not just regards to LGBT people, but intersectionality, uh, faith, people of colour, have that kind of dual approach and have that knowledge and power, and people will gravitate to it, to it more. They'll understand that, you know, um, if they sit with the work that we do, LGBT Foundation, we do something called Pride in Practice. We do training for uh, GPs and primary care services and in terms of inclusion. And that can mean that a poster uh, with regards to LGBT Foundation can sit in the GP's office. People know that they can have a safe, inclusive conversation. And that's an easy win there. And people can go, OK, well, actually, I don't want to talk about my smoking. I want to quit. I can feel like I can have a safe space here and talk about that. And in regards to you know, budget cuts and small margins, that's something we can all do pretty easily and pretty cost effectively. So, Right, we've got time for just one more question down here. Just really want to pull up on a point that Karen made about um, how our clients get hold of uh, nicotine replacement therapy. Um, as one of the stop smoking advisors in Oldham, it's a daily frustration. Um, you know, we speak to people and yeah, they, they don't believe they can do it, but after a conversation with, with us, they're raring to go. The motivation is, is right sky high. We then email the GPs and GPs are under pressure. They've got other things to do. And it's taking a week. You know, that, that is... And that's if, if, if the prescription's correct. Um, we're getting prescriptions not correct when we're trying to reduce patch strength from the high to the medium and the medium to the low. They're continuing, so it's just a repeat prescription being done. So, we, you know, there's, there's times when I've, I've got someone I've tried to reduce after six weeks down, and they're still getting the high strength patch after 10 weeks. So, which is cost. Um, so direct supply, I really think, is the way forward. And that would really, because you've got someone really motivated, and if they're sat in front of you, obviously when we get back into clinics, um, they can go home and they can start the very next day. Um, and that will make a massive difference. So my question is, how do we get this to go forward? How do we change this? Who wants to pick up? Well, we, we do actually use this method, as Lorraine's actually suggested there with some of our other services. 
and it has broken down a lot of barriers where we used to use voucher schemes and we transferred over to direct supply. It means that we do keep people in service. And I don't know, I want to pass over to you. I think clearly the pathway around that, around using, we don't want to use GP's time unless we need to, partly because we don't want to put extra pressure on primary care, but also it's not a great experience for our residents. It's a pathway we need to look at, whether or not direct supply is the right answer, which I know has had really good benefits elsewhere, and I know that it works well in, in, in other services as well. But also, I do think we need to involve our community pharmacies. I think there are great benefits to utilising community pharmacies, where people can particularly don't have to come to a stop smoking service to get more supply. They could, they, our community pharmacies are in our communities across the whole of the borough. So I don't think it's a conversation we can have without involving community pharmacy being part of that. But happy to pick that up as how we could look at how to make that pathway to get the right NRT, the right vaping products, to get the right support for people. Clearly that, that process doesn't work. So yeah, happy for us to, to include that conversation going forward. Just to, that is another barrier though, isn't it? You know, people come to us. Can you imagine how great it is if we can say, there's your patches, there's your mouth mm -hmm. spray, and they can go tomorrow and go for a quit. If they've got to go somewhere else, it's, it's another yeah. barrier. I guess it's just that if maybe they had a telephone conversation as a pickup and you said, actually, we're going to reduce your NRT down this week, if they could pick that up then from their community pharmacy around the corner rather than having to then come in. I think it's we should talk through what the, yeah. the, the points upon that and where they would work and where how we could make that as easy as possible. So, yeah, happy for us to do that. All right, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for the questions. Thank you for your question and all the other questions tonight. I'm afraid we've run out of time. We've rattled through quite a few different topics there. Uh, just a couple more things, and then we'll let you go. So, obviously, we wanted to have a conversation tonight, get some people giving their views, have some uh, considerations and some different thoughts on some ways forward. Part of the reason was also tr in the hope that with you guys uh, working in areas where you would potentially come across people who you could try to persuade uh, to give up smoking, that you would uh, commit to, to trying to do that in your working life. So uh, we've got uh, Elizabeth Woodworth from ABL Health. You're going to tell us a brief a bit more about the Making Smoking History in Oldham Pledge. Um, 27 years ago, I was actually working on um, a medical ward in a Greater Manchester Hospital. And I seem to be constantly nursing three men who used to come in regularly with COPD, Eric, Bob and Peter, and I can see them to this day. Um, they were in and out all of the time, and at that point you could actually smoke in the hospital. And we used to take them to smoke, and then race back to the beds, put them on the nebulizers, get them treated, send them home, they'd be back in and out again. And then between three months, uh, one year, all three of them died of COPD and then only about a year later Eric's wife actually died of cancer caused by secondhand smoke and she became a very good friend of mine obviously before she passed away and I made my pledge at that point that I would dedicate what I could do to help people to stop smoking and today I want you to do exactly the same to continue to pledge in whatever way you can to help people to stop smoking. And we haven't got very long to actually get down to that 5%. So, and from today, we can create that Tobacco Alliance, but I want you to please fill the form in that's in your pack, and somewhere we have got something for you to deposit those forms in somewhere. Um, they're over there with, with Liam. Oh, we've got a fire bucket. And um, just to drop those in, and then hopefully we will contact you shortly to be part of our alliance. Brilliant. Sounds very worthwhile. And they do say, don't they, if you're going to achieve anything in life, the first thing you should do is write down your intention. And that's a commitment then, isn't it? And then hopefully together, everyone can, everyone can try and take this thing forward. Right, so please uh, put your hands together for our, our panel tonight, all the people here and, and, and the guys who've joined us uh, through the internet. And just to finish things off, I'd just like to welcome uh, the Mayor of Oldham, Councillor Jenny Harrison to the stage to say a few words.
Good evening, everyone. Um, firstly, a very big thank you to everybody who's attended this amazing event tonight and contributing to the discussions. Um, and thank you to everybody who's been involved in putting it on, really, the preparation and, and making it happen and making it such a worthwhile um, activity. It's been stimulating, challenging, and full of passion. Um, and it's fantastic to see the dedication in this room, uh, dedication to improving the health and life chances of olden people. It's really made us aware, I think, of the, the size of the challenge, really, the impact of smoking on individuals, families, um, on the health services, on the economy of Oldham. So we welcome everything that's been said tonight. We welcome your suggestions, your contributions, your creative thinking, which will feed into developing the local tobacco control strategy and action plan, and into the work of Oldham Tobacco Alliance. Colleagues will be in touch regarding the first meeting of the Tobacco Alliance at the beginning of November and to share updates on progress. Meanwhile, we hope you'll join us in supporting local people to stop smoking as part of Stocktober by taking part in local events and sharing the messaging on social media through and through your networks. And you might still be doing it, but thank you for making pledges and commitments to progressing tobacco control work locally and moving this agenda forward. This is a true demonstration of the Team Oldham approach. Finally, thank you all for coming to tonight. Our panel, who just so ably um, laid it out for us, answered our questions, and to everyone who's taken part. And of course, not forgetting our a very accomplished host for the evening, Kevin. Together, we can work towards making smoking history in Oldham. Thank you. So thank you to Councillor uh, Harrison. That brings it to a close. Thanks again for your attendance. Uh, and uh, obviously you, you fill your pledge, the team will be in touch and just get out there and, and make the difference you possibly can. Thanks a lot. <laughs>